Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being with us. It is now five past the time and we will start the program. Thank you once again for being with us and especially for those of you who have joined us the entire week. It has been quite a long week with the Africa Regional Training on Immobility Charging Infrastructure. We started on Monday uh, with the Kigali sessions where we did a soft launch of the Kigali Solutions Plus policy paper. And then we proceeded to charging in a sustainable urban mobility and urban planning perspective. On Wednesday and Thursday, we looked into Dar es Salaam and where we talked about the immobility policy and planning integration, business models and safety standards. Today marks the final day of the Africa Regional Training 2021, and we cap it off with the national training in Kenya. What you see in front of you is the agenda for today. Um, we will have a needs assessment exercise by my colleague Stephanie who, from UN Habitat, who will be basically picking your minds to see what do you think are the needs in the immobility sector in Kenya. Then we will hand over to GIZ, who will talk about funding the immobility transition in Kenya. And we will have Amos Mwangi of UN Environment, who will talk about a case for electric two and three wheeler uh, in Kenya. Then we will proceed to ITDP, who will give us a case for electric buses, a Q&A session, and, in, and then we will enter a very interactive panel discussion. Our panelists are already on board. We look forward to having them. Apologies from Martin Eshiwani, who was called to urgent matters this morning, but every other panelist is on board. Feel free to chat with them, to ask questions in the chat, and we will be um, dealing with them shortly as the program continues. So without much further ado, I will hand over to my colleague, Steffi. Steffi, are you with us? Yes, good morning also from my side. Thank you, Judith, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. Excited that we are finalizing this week now with the National Training for Kenya. Um, in order to get us, get, get us started, we wanted to do a quick um, capacity building needs assessment. and. If in order to do that, um, I'm going to share my screen. One quick second. You now should be able to see Mentimeter slides. Um, and you might be familiar with Mentimeter now, a tool that has very much been used, I think, in many workshops. Um, it will show us real-time um, responses. And I think it'll, it'll give us a very good insight into what are, what are the capacity building needs that we find are most relevant for the Kenyan context. With that in mind, um, I would kindly like to invite you to go to uh, menti.com, as you can see at the top of the slide, and uh, use the code that's written there, 92967114. Um, and once you managed to log in, either from your smartphones or from your uh, computers or any other devices, um, you could look at the first question that we want to ask, which is, where do you think lies the highest need for capacity building in Kenya? And with that, I think we really want to understand what uh, the Kenyan stakeholders would find most useful in terms of training needs um, going forward. And let's give ourselves a bit of time and reflect a bit on the question and on the answers. Uh, I know there's a lot of answers um, there, so I think we need a bit of time to read through them and put down our, our opinions. Um, Steffi, could you reshare the code, please, yeah. on the chat? Okay, thanks. On the chat? Yeah, give me one second. Happens. Judith, could you do that? 92967114. Yes, Steffi. That would be nice, just so I don't have to go back from the screen share mode. That would be super. I hope it works for everyone. If you struggle, please let us know. Could you 
it. I'm seeing the slide populating slowly, slowly. We have six responses, seven responses by now. It's looking like we have a number one um, capacity building needs. Um, seeming to materialize around vehicle and infrastructure technology where we already have eight responses. So that seems to be really much um, a need going forward. I also see that uh, in terms of policy integration and planning, there seems to be quite a need, um, which I think will also be hopefully taken up today um, by the presenters a little bit. And then we have capacity building needs around financing and fiscal schemes, around business modeling. I think also two very important points to make e-mobility feasible in its implementation and its, its feasibility, I think, uh, in the longer term. So, yeah, then we also have operations and e-mobility integration taking shape with three responses and we have then procurement and contracting with two responses and advocacy and communications with one response. I think that gives us already some good picture around um, where the where the needs of the highest need for capacity building lies. Um, so I think as the solutions plus uh, partners and team, we would really be looking at targeting the trainings going forward around the topics that you're mentioning here. And I think we very much take note of vehicle infrastructure technology and also policy integration as well as business modeling and financing as the top priorities, it seems. With that, um, thank you so much for the responses on that slide. I'll be moving to the next one. If my system allows me to do that, one second. There we go. So we would like to dig a bit deeper into the EV infrastructure capacity building needs. And we wanted to ask your opinion around the following uh, six answers. What do you think are the highest capacity building needs when we look at infrastructure? Is it around electric vehicle charging? So looking at two, three, and four wheelers. Is it about e-bus charging? Is it about charging standards? Is it about charging plans in the sense of looking at, for example, the, the, the timings and, and, and the operations of the charging? Or do we feel uh, we want to learn more about the localization of charging points or maybe also electricity grids? We would also like to invite you to provide your insights onto this question if possible. So with the same, Menti link and the same numbers, you should be able to access this question as well. slowly taking shape. So we already have nine responses and they all seem to be somewhat important, which is interesting. We don't have much or that much variations between the different needs, but we still see some bias towards uh, electric vehicle charging for two, three, and four wheelers, followed by charging standards and electricity grid needs, which is then followed by the localization of charging points. Now we're moving and uh, I think e-bus charging and charging plans. 
I'll be waiting a bit for the people that have just joined to maybe also provide their insights. We know we now have 11 responses. If someone still wants to provide their input, please do so. Well and good, it seems to be coming to a halt. Thank you very much also for your insights here. I think we'll definitely be talking about uh, charging and uh, charging standards and electricity grid also in the presentations today. If we feel we want to have a deeper discussion on those, we will have a long panel discussion today. So please feel free to ask any of the questions that you have on those topics also to the panelists, um, panelists in today's session. And as mentioned, we'll be taking up some of those topics also in the trainings going forward as part of the project and um, continuously. Going to the next slide. Looking at the technology capacity needs, um, what, where do you think li lies the highest um, demand for capacity building? Is it around EV specifications? Is it around manufacturing and maintenance skills? Is it around battery management? Or is it on the end life of the battery management? Please also provide your insights here if, if you want to. I see we got the hang of Mentimeter. Uh, responses are coming very quickly now, which is super. Thank you so much. Nine responses so far. We seem to have a number one on manufacturing and maintenance uh, skills with 4.1. Seems to be an important capacity building need followed then by EV specifications and battery management. And then followed with the end of life battery um, management. Good, we have gotten again to our 11 responses. I think those might be the people active on Mentimeter for now. So thank you very much also on that question. We hope that we can answer a few of the capacity building needs in today's discussion and the others going forward. Over to the next slide on procurement and financing capacity building needs. Do we feel there's training needs on TOR development? Or is it rather on financing options for e-mobility? Is it more on financing requirements in terms of how to access the fundings? Or is it more on the procurement and contracting side? And again, your insights will be much appreciated. So far, there seems to be given quite an importance to financing options and financing requirements with answers above four. So that seems to be quite a need going forward um, for strengthening the capacities of the Kenyan stakeholders on those fronts. Financing options at 4.2 seems to be from this discussion the most important for now. Good, we have 12 responses. I think we can leave it there. And we take note of the importance for, for trainings on financing options and requirements going forward. And over to the last question. 
here we just wanted to find out if there is any other topics that you think we should cover around electric mobility and electric vehicles, topics that we should be taking up in future trainings as part of the Solutions Plus project, topics that we haven't discussed yet in the Mentimeter session as of now, so please feel free to add them here and let us know your opinion so we can really target our trainings going forward to the needs that we have in Kenya. The word local is popping up. I believe that might mean that we probably would have to really localize uh, the trainings to the Kenyan context. Um, if I'm misunderstanding that, uh, please, to the participant that has put the word, uh, clarify in the chat. We'll be happy to learn more on what you mean by local. City to city exchanges on e buses. I think that's really an important aspect, and I hope that that can be worked on in the Solutions Plus project over the next few years. Looking at used electric vehicles, also a very important point. Looking at the benefits, and I assume also making the benefits known through advocacy and communication. Looking at the informal sector involvement, a very important point, and I think we might also learn more today uh, on that from maybe OPBUS and a few other stakeholders. Battery disposal, V2G, wireless energy transfer, repairs and maintenance. Good point as well to make e mobility also feasible for the context here without too much always external support that is needed. Interoperability. So, yeah, taking good shape here. Thank you so much for thank you so much for your insights there. I think I leave the slide open for a little bit because those will really be helpful to shape the training needs going forward. With that, I might stop the share, but feel free to still provide your insights on the last slide. I think that's very important to take note of the training needs that haven't been captured, and I'll be handing over to Judith at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steffi. All is very interesting to begin by understanding what are the needs and also to see if during the presentation some of these needs will be addressed already. Um, so again, feel free to use the chat area to ask your questions, to interact with our presenters as we begin the presentations now. I will be welcoming Haman Koba of GIZ, who will give us a brief um, presentation on financing the e-mobility transition in Kenya. Haman, if you're with us, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to put this on. Okay, uh, Judith, maybe you can confirm you can hear me and see the slide quite well. Perfectly, Haman. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I was quite uh, surprised in the uh, Menti um, survey that Stephanie was doing that um, publicity and advocacy is not seen as a major concern. So it's quite interesting to see that, um, at least to get perspectives different from what we thought. Um, otherwise, my name is Haman Kuaba. I work with GIZ. Um, in Kenya, I'm in, in the transport portfolio um, within what is called the um, Energy Transport and Climate Change Cluster. Um, in GIZ Kenya. With regards to um, e-mobility, I'm just sharing a bit of our portfolio and what we've been doing um, so far. Um, we've had um, uh, one major project that was called Advancing Transport and Climate Strategies. And it's good to see engineer Michael Mushiri in the call who we've worked very closely with, as well as other uh, players who uh, we've interacted quite closely with um, within that project. Um, so the project, uh, part of what we delivered was an assessment of the regulatory environment um, on electric vehicles in Kenya. And we looked at the taxation regime, the vehicle registration system, as well as um, around um, electric vehicle standards. Further to that, we also did some work on the mitigation potential for electric mobility. Um, 
this is primarily um, since this um, came out as one of the uh, main issue or main um, aspects uh, from the Ministry of Transport side with regards to meeting um, commitments made both locally and internationally with regards to um, emission targets. Further, we also, um, we've been doing quite a lot of private sector engagement. Um, um, we're always open to talk to new players who are coming into the market, give um, insights where necessary, um, give connections, um, links, and, and that sort of thing, and a little bit on public awareness as well. Um, so getting the bikes out there to the um, public, um, showcasing what products we have in the market as well, very closely working with the private sector players. Um, as well, very day-to-day -day technical support to the State Department of Transport on all issues of electric mobility. And I would also like to highlight one project here, the Transformative Urban Mobility Initiative, um, Electric Bus Mission. Um, this is an initiative that came out of the um, Climate Friendly Transport Initiative um, launched um, um, at the Climate Action Summit in 2019. The main objective here is to ensure readiness of about 100,000 electric buses by 2025 and offering support to cities, Nairobi being one of the target cities. Um, and as well, looking at um, a network of um, players and, and support to different cities all over the place. So I was asked to speak around financial mechanisms and funding for um, potential funding for electric buses. And I have, I think, around seven minutes to go now. Um, I will jump into it quite straightforward. I've also included links to the resource materials um, in each of the slides that I'm sharing. So um, you could get a little bit more information um, from there. Now, there are quite a number of different categories, but based on what we've done within GAZ, we realized um, we can categorize it into three um, broader areas. Um, so now what we call non reimbursable funds and here issues around grants. Um, I will give examples, for instance, in Kenya, um, research and development seems to be where a lot of grants is currently directed at. Um, we have also invested um, as GIZ um, in a pilot in Western Kenya, uh, looking at um, uh, what sort of products fit um, the local market. So primarily looking at motorcycles, um, cargo bikes, as well as other different products um, that fit the local market. So this is purely around proof of concept, research and development um, aspects. And it's purely um, at the moment grant-based. I think um, we'll hear a little bit more from the private players as well, what they think. There's also been some investments around the operations in Kenya. Um, not sure if it's grants, but um, an example of the funding from Infraco to Nopia comes into mind here. Um, so I'm not sure whether it's grant primarily or it's, it's but I, I think it's something around there. Um, with regards to the other four around public transport budget, firebox revenue and ad advertising revenue, I think this will really pick up once we get more um, government control on public transport fleets. Um, I think with the BRT operation, we might get to see this um, a little bit of more um, innovative um, revenue generation aspects um, like advertising. Um, so giving space for advertisements and, and that sort of thing um, and raising resources to uh, maybe meet the initial costs of um, upfront cost of purchasing an e-bus um, as it's being at the moment planned for um, one of the main corridors of the BRT. Um, tax breaks, one key example here is um, the excise duty reduction that was done, I think, in 2018, 2019 finance uh, bill that saw a reduction of 10 of, uh, from 20 to 10% for importation of um, um, electric vehicles into the country. So this is one of those key measures that we've actually at least um, actualized as a country um, that I can say, but uh, there's a lot of more interest to see um, more um, assets being included in this excess duty reduction because at the moment it only covers 100% um, 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 vehicles, some motor vehicles, but uh, motorcycles, which seems to be the highest in demand are not covered in the excess duty reduction. So this is something that we could also take up in our engagement with government. Um, loans, concession loans and market loans, um, concessional loans, primarily um, entities like FW, EIBs, uh, mostly working in this area. Uh, there's a lot of interest at the moment, I will say, um, to see that at least one of the corridors of the BRT um, uh, is, is fully electric, something that is um, 
definitely um, achievable and very realistic for our country, considering um, um, our um, energy, uh, you know, mix, and, and we also produce excess power. Um, further to that, there are different other financial mechanisms um, leasing, and this is primarily trying to bring down the um, the upfront costs of, of the bus. Um, so there is models where um, batteries, um, um, battery as a service, so you buy um, the bus, but not the batteries is, 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 is owned by the um, utilities or, or different other entities that provide that. So this is one of those other, um, I would say, financial options that are currently working out. In Western Kenya, in the pilot that I mentioned, um, the, the main business model is leasing and it's, it's a pay as you go, um, not really pay as you go, it's primarily mainly just leasing of the bus per day, of, of the electric uh, motorcycles that we have in a day to border border operators. And it seems to be working out quite well because then the upfront cost issue is, is significantly taken care of. Um, so there are a lot of issues that are still being worked out, but um, I will say at the moment, um, the way the market looks like and considering the high um, costs, the initial cost of buying the EV, this is one of those options, leasing and also um, doing um, a battery as a service um, model. Um, consensions, public procurement contracts, um, so still advertising contracts, trying to raise revenue in order to finance um, e-mobility um, options. Um, so these are the main, I would say, the main different categories of, of financial mechanism that exists. I wanted to, at this point, highlight um, a few examples, um, just two primarily, um, and one is from China, um, and, and how they have been quite successful in uh, uh, um, increasing uptake of electric vehicles, particularly um, for public bus um, uh, fleet. And uh, one of the main thing um, I will say, particularly since we have a lot of decision makers in the call here today, um, setting of a very well-defined targets, either at city level or at national level. I mean, at the moment, um, we are fully aware. Um, someone might need to mute. It is still in existence. Um, please mute, sorry. Um, so this very clear targets um, seems to work quite well um, in, in an example of China that I'm giving here and demonstration and projects and, and as well, um, very um, well thought out incentives, primarily purchase subsidies uh, because of the high upfront costs um, of, of, of owning a, an electric vehicle. As well, it's not always just about fiscal incentives, but as well, I mean, there's indirect consumer incentives, um, looking at uh, issues around maybe uh, parking uh, availability, making it free for owners of electric vehicles, or a lot of um, consumer awareness initiatives and that sort of thing as well. Um, charging infrastructure, um, and, and one of what I said, um, specific city level targets. And, and this is primarily with regards to um, making sure that the political message is quite clearly um, set out. I wanted to give out an example of, of requirements for, for like the NAMA facility um, and why the whole entire aspects of uh, having a very well set out target or sending the clear political signal is important. Um, because you will see, for instance, the most recent call um, within the NAMA facility, they give um, funding for up to about 25 million euros, um, which is quite um, good resources. For private companies, they will give about 5 million euros, but um, when it comes to nationally led initiative, it's usually about 25 million euros. So those who are not familiar with the NAMA facility, it's a climate finance facility. Um, in full, it's called the Nationally Appropriate Mitigation Action um, Facility. Um, and they do annual calls um, for projects uh, that fit within the, um, or contribute towards meeting the Paris Agreement target. And what was quite interesting is that for this particular year, um, it was bound to, um, it was bound or set against nationally determined contributions that every country submits. So NDCs um, or the mitigation targets that countries have set. So if a country had not revised it in DC and made it ambitious, you definitely um, would not qualify to, to, to put up a project, I mean, in that sense. 
So you will not qualify for even applying or meeting the basic criteria for um, potential funding from, from the NAMA facility. So for me, uh, my main message here is that um, the one key thing is this whole political environment, and it's good that we have a lot of um, decision makers in the call, uh, making sure that we have the correct um, um, set targets, standards, policy environment that send out the, 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 the correct signals. Um, overall, what has been realized is that countries and cities that have, have, um, uh, have had the highest fiscal incentives have been the ones that have been most successful in transitioning to electric mobility. So I think at the very initial stage, there's a lot of work or a lot of um, um, input, primarily from the um, government side or the policy environment to trigger the market and then drive it towards the of the right direction um, towards uptake of electric vehicles. So um, being able to set or we'll use or leverage public funding in order to catalyze um, resources from the private market, it's, it's really key. Um, investments in um, proof of concept and, and, and you know, research and development and, 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 and heavy private sector mobilization, it's, 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 it's really key. So primarily my main message today is um, how do we as a country look at um, being able to get resources uh, primarily, uh, I will say from the exchequer uh, in order to facilitate the, the market since it's really, really um, still very, very modest, very few players and um, being in a position to secure public funds to catalyze um, the market growth will be really, really key. Um, I will stop there um, and, and look forward to the discussions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. All right. Thank you very much, Haman. I already have questions of my own and I can see some questions being sent in the back channel. So we will take some of these questions to you in the Q&A session. Um, next, we have Amos Mwangi who will present to us a case of electric two and three wheelers in Kenya. Amos, if you're with us, take it away. Thanks, Judith. Uh, just give me a second to share my presentation. There you go. So uh, thank you as the, um, thank you Julie once again for having me in the session. Um, my name is Amos Rihad, um, working for UNEP at the Sustainable Mobility Unit. And what we do at the Sustainable Mobility Unit is we help uh, work with countries, governments to assist in transitioning to uh, sustainable mobility, especially on the technology side, looking at the fuels and vehicles uh, in, in terms of setting in place standards and policies that would uh, allow the, an enabling environment for um, uh, sustainable mobility. And also looking at non motorized transport and now looking at fuel efficiency and uh, electric mobility. So what I will be sharing today is uh, our experience, which has been under the electric mobility program. Uh, what we did is that we received some funding from the BME ICI and uh, the funding was to uh, assist in integrating two and three wheelers in urban transport in developing countries, both in the Southeast Asia and the East African countries. Uh, within the project, what we've done is uh, we had an initial phase where we did a sort of baselining uh, to just establish the, the trend in terms of the increase in um, motor, motorcycles in the countries and, and three wheelers also. Uh, looking at the energy situation, looking at the manufacturing potential, so just establishing sort of like a baseline. And uh, with this, we worked with the uh, EPRA when they were called ERC back then. Um, and another phase of this project has been to roll out demonstrations, just uh, as Haman has mentioned, uh, to sort of uh, try to establish a proof, a proof of, of concept for electric two wheelers. And uh, so we received a donation from TLG, and uh, we've been working with Sustainable Transport Africa. Uh, to to uh, facilitate the pilots. Uh, just a bit of background and context. Um, if you see on the graph on the left side, your left side, you can see how uh, back in 2008, when the government uh, introduced a policy to zero rate motorcycles, you can observe just a 
quite a significant increase in motorcycles all the way to um, the level that you can already see. And interestingly, over the years, as you may know, uh, the annual um, sales of electric, uh, sorry, annual sales of uh, two wheelers, motorcycles, has exceeded uh, the vehicles, uh, which is quite a significant thing. So if anyone would uh, would assume that policy doesn't work, this is just a clear example. <clears throat> so also, Haman has alluded to this. We have uh, a largely renewable electricity generation capacity. We have excess power. And uh, once again, on, on the two wheelers, they are not as complex in, in terms of assembling or manufacturing as you would consider vehicles. Um, a recent study that was uh, done by the Flown Initiative showed quite um, an interesting awareness in uh, awareness level in electric mobility sector in, in Kenya. This, the survey was done in uh, Kisumu, Nairobi, and then Mombasa, places where you'd expect uh, people to be quite uh, in the know on electric mobility, but these are the results. So it clearly identifies a gap um, in, in this sector. Um, I'd also want to highlight just briefly the subsector's impact in terms of employment. You see 400,000 Kenyans being employed who have um, families that are relying on them, maybe up, up to 2.4 million uh, individuals. So it's quite a significant subsector. Uh, the other thing is that the subsector, in, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of uh, wholesale and re retail, in terms of maintenance, it quite employs an, a number of individuals. And so uh, once again, emphasizing the significance of this sector. So what have we been trying to do, even as we talk about electric mobility in Kenya and the, the demonstration. What we've been trying to do is to uh, facilitate barrier removal. One, one in terms of policy and regulatory barriers. What, what we've done back in 2017 in conjunction with GIZ and CAPS and government stakeholders, we assisted in standard development, the initial standard de development for electric mobility. And we, uh, we have been working also to see how we can introduce incentivize uh, um, uh, electric mobility. We're also trying to remove the technical barriers in terms of the vehicle specs and the skills. And, and we're also looking at electric uh, economic or financing, um, the financing aspect and the awareness aspect. Um, once again, as Haman mentioned, it was very interesting to see that the awareness part is uh, very low from the negative results. But anyway, so the, our pilot specifically has tried to look at the technical barriers in terms of the vehicle specs and to just try to push this message that electric mobility works <clears throat> across the country. So what we started out is when we received the donations from uh, TLG after an agreement of the specs that we would require, what we did is we, we had uh, all the partners who, who I'm going to be speaking about uh, soon come together and uh, be taken through an, uh, a training that expressed how to put together these electric mobility uh, vehicles in, in, a, in a safe way. And the, saf the safety checks to, to look at, and uh, also in terms of operation and maintenance to just um, see how they can do that. Um, so how did the, how we set up this demonstration? We have four partners who are already um, rolling out this, this uh, 49 electric motor motorcycles. That is Karura Forest. Um, most of you may know it, it's an urban forest in, in Nairobi. Uh, Kenya Power, the, the utility company for Kenya. Uh, Kisumu County, the uh, subnational government and Power High, which is an energy company, but working with the uh, um, border border operators, but back in, in Kisi County. So they Pilot runs from April 2020 to April 2021. And um, so I'll be speaking briefly on the kind of specs which we got for the bikes that we are rolling out. So if you see from the pictures up above and uh, down below, there is uh, the, the picture on the, the, on the right, below right, is a hub mounted engine. The, the engine, the motor is on the wheel and the, the picture above is the one that is center mounted. So uh, th those are the different uh, layouts that we have. And then we had a very small battery, two kilowatt hour, which uh, is able to produce 50 to 60 kilometers of range. And the charging is through a normal uh, socket from your house. So 
uh, just a, a bit of a deep dive into these uh, projects. What we did for Karura, the use case is for patrolling. It's used by the, the, the units are used by the scout to patrol uh, the forest. And what we observe is the, the, the forest roads are all weather roads. So when it rains, there are um, the struggles for that. And then there's minimal elevation change. Uh, as you can see from the metrics there, uh, we say the expected range was 50 to 60 kilometers. What they've been able to do is 44 kilometers as the longest. Um, the charging time is three to five hours. And as you can see, even other metrics, you, you, you can already see, read for yourself. But one of the, some of the challenges that uh, have come up so far, as I said, we are running this up to April next year. So these are intermittent uh, or intermediate results. So the charging time has been a bit of a, of a challenge, uh, structural inconsistencies, electric system faults, but uh, looking at the advantage sides, because of the silence in the um, units when you're riding them, they are just ideal for patrolling. Then there's, there's been significant fuel savings, especially when uh, this season when, when there, are, there were hikes in the prices of fuel. Uh, for Kisumu County, they've been used by the inspector, the city inspector, to just to do their random uh, checks. Uh, the use case largely on tarmac. There's minimal elevation on, on that side. We look, we, we through the data that we've already received, the average range, um, looking at how they've been using, they've been able to do up to 45 kilometers, and a maximum of speed of 68 kilometers per hour. <clears throat> Once again, the challenge of long charging times limited maximum speed i guess when you're when you're riding on tarmac then uh, the speeds must be high it should, should be expected to be high so um again the fuel cost savings have been a big big benefit for them uh kenya power they actually decided to rebrand the uh, repaint rebrand the, the, the unit that we gave them to fit into the branding uh, strategy for kenya power but uh so they've been used for meter reading uh, the conditions are varying because they have to access the houses which are uh, which range from uh, good road conditions to very bad road conditions. The elevation change has been varying, and what we've seen is that uh, uh, for this the unit that we got, then they actually have, were able to achieve a maximum of 72 kilometers per hour. Um, uh, the these these units have had the long charging time and limited travel because, as I said. What we, we have seen is that uh, the, the, the units are required to take the meter readers to the, each, each of the homes that they are reading the meters, eh? the power, power meters. <clears throat> and um, because of the difference in, in length, the, 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 the range of, um, that, that, is, that was expected of them has not been very sufficient. But what uh, has come out very clearly from, from them is that this is a technology they actually want to embrace because it only makes sense. They, 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 uh, they are the utility company. They can very easily um, have the units for, for, um, for use there with reduced cost. And of course, we are saving cost and a suitable business case for the company, yeah, even as they look at looking at uh, four wheelers. Um, so what are the lessons we've drawn? Some of the um, intermediate lessons, preliminary lessons. It, this is a viable technology. They are net fuel savings. Um, many of the riders have been stopped on the way and uh, were asked uh, how did they get this, this unit? And it's actually, people are really interested in acquiring this technology. Um, what we've also noticed, as, as, you, as you've heard from what I've presented, is that the, the battery or the range that is available within with the battery that, that we have is not sufficient. So we need a solution for uh, batteries, be it bigger batteries or swapping or something that just fixes the charging uh, issue. Uh, what we've also noticed is that uh, there's need for modifications. Some of the units were actually modified, have already been modified. I didn't in, uh, put, provide a picture for this, but they have been modified to, for example, uh, insert mud flaps because of the kind of terrain that they're using. Then. Um, so we need also to look at uh, whether we, we, are, we are trying, we want to increase the range and increase the um, cost of the unit, initial cost of the unit, or, you know, uh, there are things we need to consider. Then we also need to progressively improve in terms of even the structure of the bike, in terms of the components, in terms of uh, 
um, suitability for, for, for the purpose. And the opportunities that we've identified so far, there's, this is not an exhaustive list, but there's a lot of manufacturing potential, especially for the things that we, are, we, can, we can be able to uh, develop in the in-country. In the technical skills uh, in terms of battery management, controller assembly, and basically the maintenance part of it, we also need to uh, up, up that side. Uh, we also need to improve on uh, awareness, standards and policies to incentivize, but at the same time provide standards that can limit whatever we are attracting to our, to our country to be of good quality. We need to support uh, research and development, innovation, uh, inclusivity, gender inclusivity. Uh, we also need to look at that because what we've seen is that, uh, like for example, for the study that I was talking about earlier, it's been 2.6% of um, riders or females. So things like that, we need to look at these ownership models or acquisition of these units, we need to also look at this. So this is not an exhaustive list of uh, the opportunities that exist, but these are some of these, the, the opportunities we've seen through the pilot. So I'll stop at that and wishing um, you all a, rest, a good uh, rest of the session. Thank you very much, Amos, and really interesting to see your experience with the electric two and three wheelers in Kenya. There are quite a number of questions for you as well, and we will take that during the Q&A session. Very quickly, we hand over to Chris Cost, who will also give us um, a case for electrified buses in Kenya. Over to you, Chris. Great. Thanks, Judith. Yeah. So from two wheelers, we'll shift to e-buses and, and I wanna give some insights on the experience in cities around the world and what they've been finding in their e-bus deployments and how we might apply some of those lessons learned in Kenya. So when it comes to bus electrification, there are several main benefits, you know, as, as anyone who's used public transport in Nairobi knows, you know, our streets and the CBD are filled with smoke. Um, if you spend, a, you know, even a, an hour there moving around from one stage to another, you'll probably end up with a headache. So it's really important to reduce the local emissions and, and also GHGs um, that we have this shift to cleaner vehicles. Another key advantage um, in a country like Kenya where we're importing our fuel um, is that we'll be able to shift to a local energy source because we, we do have um, relatively clean electricity, especially in the Nairobi area. And, and so we can avoid those, those really expensive fuel imports. Um, now, the main challenge is that the buses are much more expensive, um, you know, two to three times higher upfront costs um, in the vehicles and, and chargers and other equipment. And, and that, that's offset to some extent by the, the lower maintenance costs for electric vehicles and also the lower energy costs. Um, but you still have to do the numbers in each case and, and, and figure out the total cost of ownership to see what kind of gap there is that needs to be filled through the creative financing sources like Herman described. Um, and yeah, it requires a, a shift from thinking about just buying vehicles to this entire system where, where we need to have um, space for the charging equipment and, and, and a good network of depots. And it's going to involve several actors. So the, you know, public transport authority, namely Namata uh, in Nairobi, and the operators, manufacturers, other equipment suppliers, and, and, and the utilities. Um, so here are some stats that we can compiled on the costs of e-buses around the world. And what you can see here is that the, you know, the costs are upwards of double the costs of a conventional diesel bus. And that runs even higher in China and India, where they tend to use cheaper vehicles. Even the diesel vehicles are, are much cheaper than they are in the European and Latin American markets. And, and there you're talking about a threefold um, increment. So this is key um, to address if, if we want the industry to start adopting e-vehicles in the country. Um, another important factor is the, the current performance of e-buses. And what you can hear some stats from Chinese cities where you can see that the, the average in 2019 was only 139 kilometers per bus per day. And, and so that's, that's a bit lower than what we'd expect from a, a typical diesel bus. 
And, and so it's important to take that into account when you're looking at how to deploy the e-buses e and, and integrate that with the service planning that you're doing. And the usual result of the, the, the lower uh, kilometer capacity is that usually you need to have a bus replacement ratio that's greater than one, right? So for every diesel bus that you're replacing, you'll need to have um, uh, more than one e-bus. And you can see that in some of these early conversions in China, um, sometimes it even approached two bus, two e-buses for every diesel bus, you know, whereas Santiago was able to get a much better ratio, um, perhaps with a, you know, a better bus spec, but it's still higher than one. And, and so you need to consider whether you have the depot space for that larger number of buses and, and also cover that cost. Um, yeah, and then getting into those specific costs, we here are some numbers that we ran um, in, in partnership with UNEP, looking at the Trans Jakarta system, and you can see the the breakdown. You know, aside from the the cost of the bus itself, the battery is a significant component. Um, import tariffs make a big difference. You know, Herman was talking about the efforts to reduce the the import tariffs on e vehicles in Kenya. Um, there are also the chargers, and <clears throat> you can see that for the, the second phase that, that we modeled for Trans Jakarta, there's also a significant cost of, uh, of getting the additional depot spaces to be able to handle the, the increased number of buses. And then here's how it looks for the operating costs for the, for the same deployment in, in Jakarta. And it's interesting to see how small the energy cost is out, out of the whole mix, right? Um, so so that, that does definitely go down when you implement e-buses, but um, important to consider the other costs that will come along. Now, at the end of the day, these are the results that we got, that the, the e-buses would still have a, a slightly over 50% higher total cost of ownership compared to diesel buses. So in spite of the lower maintenance costs, you know, given that high purchasing cost, there's still a gap to fill. And, and so the, the government of Indonesia is currently looking at how to fill this gap. You know, how can they raise that through climate finance or concessional loans or other mechanisms to be able to support this deployment? Now, as Her Herman also mentioned, um, you know, China has been one of the countries that's taken a very aggressive stance in, in electrifying buses. And you can see how the proportion of new energy buses has, you know, has risen to, to two thirds of, of all the buses now. Um, and this includes both uh, CNG and hybrid and, and electric buses. Um, but you can see this dramatic change that's happened um, over, over a short span of time, um, you know, because of the national level fiscal incentives that are there. Um, and here's the current mix. So battery electric buses are, are represent more than half of the fleet at this point. Um, so it's totally transformed the, the city bus fleets in the country and, and reduce the emissions that, that they produce. Um, yeah, and one, one city that's really taken a lead is Shenzhen. And you can see how, here how they've, you know, they've, they've done a full conversion of their bus fleet over a short span of time. And it required coming up with a, a, an innovative financing model um, where they, they, you know, in addition to these national government subsidies that they received, they worked with a leasing company that paid for the new buses and, and then uh, provided them to the operator um, for a fee over time. So this is how they were able to support that rapid rollout. Now, as more and more cities have started adopting e-buses, the national government has been able to ratchet those subsidies back down. And so you can see that they've, you know, they, they've almost been you know, completely el eliminated now that the, you know, the cost of production and the local industry has been built up and, and cities now have the experience to run these buses. So it's not something that you need to do indefinitely, but it's helpful in that initial transition phase um, to overcome the market hurdles. Another uh, case that's worth looking at is Santiago. Um, this is one of the most ambitious electrifications of, of a bus fleet outside of China. And what was really critical to, to their approach, and I think also um, you know, can inform what we're doing in Nairobi, is the, the changes they made in the business model. Now, what, what was happening before is they, they had a small number of very large operators um, who not only 
procured their bus fleets, but also were in charge of supplying their own depots. And, and so this, this whole arrangement meant that these operators had a, a, a ton of market power. And, and so when one of the operators was no longer able to function, it was very hard for the government to, um, to pull in new players to fill the gap, right? Um, because these operators had become too big to fail. And so what the government's now doing is to provide a government depot space, okay? Um, so that that's no longer tied to the operator and to have shorter operator contracts that are separate from the fleet provision contracts. And, and so this gives them more flexibility. So if an operator is not performing, they're able to bring someone new in to provide the service. And there are a couple of business models that they've followed. So for the, you know, for an initial batch of buses that, that were tendered in 2018, they worked with the energy company um, to, to buy the buses from the manufacturer. And, and then the, there was a separate contract with the operators. And in the new phase for, for 2,000 additional e-buses, um, they'll, they'll no longer be working with the energy provider per se, but, but still having a separate fleet provider. Um, and it, it's also important to notice that the, the payment model for the bus operations is uh, in large part per kilometer with a smaller per passenger component. And, and that's very different from Kenya where we're still um, you know, basing 100% of the remuneration on the passengers. And that contributes to a lot of the service quality challenges that we have. And this kind of race to the bottom in terms of vehicle quality and emission standards and, and customer service where everyone's just trying to maximize profit um, rather than thinking about providing a good service to the passengers. Um, and then the final model I want to talk about is Rio de Janeiro, where ITDP has been working with the government to identify how to transition from the current um, BRT operating model to a new tendering model um, that will coincide with the introduction of e-buses. Now, for, you know, for all the, you know, the, the very positive elements of the BRT system from an infrastructure design perspective, it has high quality stations, passing lanes, and so on. Um, from the business model is, is still based on a net cost contract. Um, and, you know, and, and it still results in, in some of the same service quality challenges that we have in Nairobi. Um, because the BRT operators in, in that case are collecting the fares themselves. And as a result, they have all the access to the data. Um, the government doesn't, you know, have direct access to how many people are entering the turnstiles. Um, you know, how much revenue is coming in. And so it makes it very hard to plan the system and really know um, how these operators are doing. And that's leading to a number of problems. You know, um, there's a lot of fare evasion um, and, and, you know, lower ridership. And so that's reducing the revenue. The companies in turn um, invest less in their buses and don't operate as much service. That drives people to use private modes and this becomes a vicious cycle. So in the new model that we're recommending, there will be an independent fair collection operator um, who will have a, a, a separate contract with government. And, and then the operator will be hired on, you know, on more or less a, a gross cost contract to provide the service. And in this case, the idea as, as in Santiago is to have a separate fleet provider um, in order to, you know, for that operator to have better access to financing options compared to what some of the bus operators may able to do. So all this is to say that when we're thinking about e-bus deployments in Kenya, it's, it's really important to do our homework on the costs of operations and the capital costs, and then to set up a robust business model so that we can overcome some of the challenges that currently plague our public transport system. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, a lot of questions as well for you um, in the chat and also in the back channel. Um, so I would like to welcome my colleague Edmund. Edmund, are you with us? Yes, uh, Judith, I am. All right. So Edmund, you will assist me with the questions as well as Tefi. Um, I will take the first question, which was towards um, Amos. And then you can help me with the questions that have been directed to Chris, if that's okay. That's fine. Thank you. All right, Amos, um, if we could have you um, join us again 
We have a few questions for you based on the presentation that you gave on electric two and three wheelers in Kenya. Um, I will ask you to, then you can give us a read from there. First question is, with the entry of electric motorcycles into the Kenyan market, what happens to the fossil fuel motorcycles? That's the first question. And the second question is, in Kenya, motorcycles are used to carry heavy loads. Could you say more on the carrying capacity of electric motorcycles based on the needs of the market? Over to you, Amy. All right, thanks, thanks Judith. Uh, thanks for those very uh, good questions. I think uh, indeed there are, there are concerns that we should be, uh, you should be worried about, uh, should be concerned about. So um, on the fossil fuels and the entry of electric uh, motorbikes, I think what we've seen is a lifetime of the current electric, uh, uh, the current uh, internal combustion engine is not that long. So in as much as we agree or we accept that there's no it, it's not going to be like an immediate phase out. There's going to be a taper down. And uh, even as we try to improve the current uh, quality of the electric mo motorcycle. So I would say it doesn't, it's not really a threat to the fossil fuel uh, motorbike. It actually makes a lot more economic sense if you look at the, the economic metrics for uh, uh, operating an, an electric uh, two-wheeler. So it will, as, as someone would tell me that uh, people follow the money, people follow where the money is. So people will follow where the money is and that's the electric uh, two-wheeler. Um, on uh, the current capacity, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, we see yes, the border borders are, are usually overloaded. And it's quite a balance because are you going to create an enabling environment for uh, you know <laughs> going against the, 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 the legal part? But that said, we also realize that the current setup of the units that we have received is not steady enough. And that's why I say there's an opportunity for continuous improvement. So I think uh, in the interest of time, that's how, how brief I'll keep my answer, thanks. Thank you, Amos. Um, and I see we still have two other questions. Maybe I will hand over those questions to Steffi. Still for you, Amos. Yep. Thanks, uh, Juliet. And back to you, Amos. Um, Odilo has asked um, about the availability of spare parts of the motorcycles. And I think he was mostly referring to the one that you presented for Kisumu. If you could shed some light on that, that would be super. Okay, thanks. Thanks, uh, Steffi. Um, what we've seen is, uh, I didn't mention that there's currently a very vibrant uh, startup um, startup scene, electric uh, mobility startup scene in the country. So what we've seen is uh, the, the spare parts, uh, first of all, the spare parts that uh, we are talking about are almost interchangeable with the in internal combustion engine, uh, except for the drivetrain. So those that are interchangeable with the internal combustion engine option are definitely available. But for this uh, electric drivetrain affiliated uh, spare parts, what we are seeing is that the startup companies have already been very proactive to uh, already bring uh, those spare parts. They uh, give an example of a time when we had an accident uh, with one of the units. And it was very interesting to find that all the things that we would have required to fix this unit were available locally. So indeed, these uh, spare parts are available. The question is whether you are linked to the correct person. So if in case you have uh, a problem, Mr. Odilo, uh, if you have a problem, maybe you can reach out to us and we can connect you to someone who would have that. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Amos. And the last question uh, by Catherine Nyambala, which is the current source of power for the two wheelers and where do they charge at the moment? Yes, yeah, so um, the, the current uh, two wheelers are charged from the wall socket. So it's not um, a complicated uh, charging infrastructure. So that, those are the ones that we're using. Granted, there is also, um, there's also uh, the swapping stations, which have been, introduced, have been introduced by the startup uh, companies that I talked about. But for these units that we are working with, they uh, are working on, um, wall socket charging yeah so uh, that should be it thanks thank you Amos and I think I'll be passing 
over to Edmund for a few questions for Chris. Yes, indeed. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, the first question uh, comes from Herman to Chris. And uh, Chris, Herman would like to know that the 54% higher total cost of ownership in the Jakarta project was after how many years of operations? Hi everyone, sure. I think for, for this and the other question about the maintenance cost, I'll, I'll probably check with our Indonesia team and, and get back to everyone so that we can get the specifics. Great, then, uh, then let's take that off uh, Dennis then. Uh, Dennis is asking that, were there incentives or subsidies in the Trans Jakarta case? And uh, what were the dynamics, just briefly? Yeah, exactly. Well, so far, Trans Jakarta has been piloting the e-buses on a, a much smaller scale. And, and so these numbers that I showed were looking at how that pilot could be scaled up to a larger level. And yeah, the idea is to, to identify ways to subsidize the service um, you know, through a combination of financing and other support that the government will need to obtain. Um, but yeah, they, I think they're, they're very uh, determined to move forward with the electrification, but it's a matter of raising that additional finance to cover the gap. Great responses there. Then uh, let's continue. We take uh, maybe more, two more questions for you, uh, Chris. The next one still comes from Dennis. Uh, Dennis is asking that, what would you advise Namata or any other county governments on the deployment of e buses in Kenya? What would be your advice to any of the, uh, the governments? Sure. Well, as I mentioned, the starting point is that we need to do good service planning and operations analysis um, because given the replacement ratio and some of the technical aspects of e-bus deployment, you know, the fact that you need to, sometimes you need to do midday recharging, you may need to have more vehicles in the fleet. It's really important to look at a route by route basis and identify how many vehicles you'll need and how, what kind of charging strategy you'll employ. So, we need to do that kind of detailed analysis for the BRT line two or whichever corridor we want to consider. And, and then we need to look carefully at the depot space um, because we'll, we'll need to have additional depot space and, and space to do this midday charging. And given that we don't currently have government owned depots in, in Kenya, that's something that will, you know, will need a lot of effort. And there, you know, there's a, a, a modest terminal under construction now at Kasarani, but we're going to need much more space um, if we want to deploy the, the buses on a widespread basis. Um, and I think it's, it's really key to frame this within the overall business model planning for the BRT, um, because Namata currently has a very limited budget. And, and so there have been questions about whether they'll even be able to enter a gross cost contract or if they'll need to go with a net cost contract, which really won't change the business model from what we have today in Nairobi. So it's key for Namata to receive enough funding to shift to a better business model based on per kilometer payments um, at the same time that we're doing this deployment, right? Because you know, we, we don't want to just change the vehicle. We want to make sure that there's a better service quality being provided. Great. Thanks a lot, Chris. There is uh, one other question, maybe just that will be very brief. Uh, it's coming from Linda Abuya. What is the feasibility of deploying buses with replaceable batteries that are exchanged at charging points? Um, yeah, this is not common, and the main issue is that the, the batteries are much larger compared to other types of vehicles like a two-wheeler, so it's just not practical um, to do that kind of battery swapping in a bus, so that's why, you know, almost all bus systems around the world, um, battery electric bus systems rely on, on overnight or other types of charging, but they keep the batteries in the vehicle. Great, thanks. Uh, back to you, Judith. 
Thank you very much, Edmund and Steffi, and thanks also to the presenters for responding to the questions. And with this, we open up the floor to our panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very interesting panel discussion, very high level decision makers in the room, and I am honored to be sharing the stage with them. Um, so I will ask all our panelists to please um, turn on their cameras so that we can all see you. Um, and then we will have a minute introduction from all of you just to um, kind of get your positions, to understand your positions when it comes to the topic of the day. And after that, um, we will proceed into the questions. So maybe I can start with, um, of course, the State Department for Transport. You can give us, introduce yourself and give us a statement before we proceed into the questions. Over to you, Engineer Mushiri. You are on mute, engineer. Apologies, apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Um, as she said, my name is Michael Mushiri. I work at the State Department for Transport. And uh, basically, you know, our mandate is just to provide oversight to the transportation systems. And uh, maybe I'll say more later. Thank you, engineer. And then we have um, Robert from the Kenya Bureau of Standards. Robert, please introduce yourself. Uh, morning, my name is uh, Robert Njoroge. I'm a standardization officer at the Kenya Bureau of Standards. Uh, basically in the standards development uh, department, we um, develop standards in uh, electrotechnology. And in this case, uh, I'm concerned in the development of standards in the immobility e sector. So I'm looking forward for this uh, panel uh, discussion to share insights from uh, the kids perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Next, we have Catherine Yambala of Kenjin. Welcome, Catherine. Good morning to all our participants. My name is Catherine Yambala. Business Process Improvement Manager at Kenjen. As you're aware, we are the largest power generator in the country, and we are very concerned about least cost options for your normal power use and for EVs, and we are also concerned about carbon emission reduction. Thank you so much, Judith. Thank you, Catherine. Happy to have you with us. Next, we have uh, Dennis Wakaba of OPBUS. Dennis? Take the stage. Uh, good morning to everybody. You uh, electric vehicle enthusiasts. So my name is Dennis Wakapa. Um, in the private sector, representing OPBUS, I'm a project coordinator looking at uh, charging infrastructure and uh, public transport, which we want to electrify. Basically, we are electric drivetrain manufacturers. And uh, we couple those to uh, any vehicle that can be electrified. We'll be engaging more and looking forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And of course, we have Herman, who you have already met. Herman will also be joining the panel. Um, also, my colleagues Edmund and Steffi will assist me with the questions as we go into the discussions. Um, and as I said, I'm really happy to have all of you here. And I think I will take the first question, which is directed possibly to Catherine Yambala of Kenjen. And there was a question earlier on as the presentations began. And this question was basically, is there a plan to reduce electricity tariffs for charging uh, services? Is there a plan to reduce electricity tariffs for charging services in Kenya? Right, Judith. So we are not talking about whether there's a plan or not. What we need to do is ensure that we keep the cost of power production low, and then the policy can match that. And so we are saying, for one, if you use renewable energies to power, it's definitely going to be lower. And if you power, power locally, and that's why I was concerned about the power that Amos is using, then you avoid transmission losses. And so if you look at the individual needs, we are going to, I, I imagine a situation whereby medium households will power at their homes using something like, let's say solar, and therefore they'll be powering at site. If you look at other options like for 
uh, malls and other charging spaces, if you have solutions such as solar, you'll be powering exactly where you are. And therefore you don't always have to power through the grid, which has transmission losses and the grid then becomes your backup. That's what I'll say for now. Uh, I hope our question is, is, is satisfied. Thank you, Catherine. And then we go to the questions on policy issues. This will be directed to Engineer Mushiri and also to Robert. Um, so Engineer Mushiri, what are the available policies presently as we speak when it comes to um, transport in Kenya and specifically e-mobility? And also for Robert, um, what are the standards available for e-mobility in the country? Maybe we start with Engineer Mushiri. You're on mute, Engineer. <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you, Judy. Um, in terms of policy and regulation, uh, the bulk of our policy documents mention in passing electric mobility. The key reason is that some of the policy documents are a decade old. Like our primary policy document, the Integrated National Transport Policy of 2012, uh, it was passed by parliament in 2012, but it was actually prepared in 2009. So it's more than 10 years old. So we need a new policy position on electric mobility. So we are reviewing this policy and uh, that will be a chapter within the review document. And that is at national level. At county level, the Nairobi city county government has a policy on uh, urban streets and road design manual and all of that. It also mentions. So let me say policy is not quite up to speed because it mentions it, 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 like in passing, but so far it has not been a hindrance towards uh, innovation or the progress of the sector. Okay. One of the challenges we are soon going to to be confronted with is the licensing of public charging infrastructure. Remember, transport is a local government issue. So county government will probably come in requiring you to license your public charging infrastructure, which you are offering at a cost. Another issue that uh, is slowly again manifesting is when you do your conversions, for example, Dennis Wakaba from Opibus, you take a diesel vehicle, petrol vehicle and convert it to electric vehicle. Then you want to change the logbook from petrol this CC to electric, of electric vehicle these kilowatts. Then you may have a few questions to answer with NTSA. Uh, closely related to that, a public service vehicle requires inspection and certification by the motor vehicle inspection unit. When you convert a diesel vehicle or petrol vehicle through a process we call retrofit, and these are the prototype designs that are emerging, then you take it to motor vehicle inspection to give you a certificate. There is what the vehicle was and there is what the vehicle is now. Then there will be questions on certification. Uh, so those are the three areas I'm seeing uh, emerging as policy and, uh, and, 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 and regulation issues as, we, as the market continues to develop. Thank you. Thank you, engineer. I see Catherine's hand is up. Yes, I'd like to add to Engineer Mushiris. It would be wonderful if everybody participating would get certified em emission reduction funding. In other words, you, some of you may be aware that Kenyan is the leaders and we have been actually, our projects have actually been funded by the UNFCC. And so if there could be a policy framework where projects such as the ones that Amos has already spoken about would get paid for the emissions they have reduced, that would tie up to what Herman spoke about earlier on NAMA. And as a country, we would all gain if everybody registered their projects and then did the monitoring and verification. 
The other policy issue is universal chargers. You don't want to travel from here to Naivasha and find that at the charging station you, you have phone, it's not compatible with your charger. And that would be wonderful if there would be some element of, and I think, uh, is it Robert or Dennis talking about standards? It would be wonderful if we could have universal chargers in the country. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Catherine. That's a natural flow into um, Robert. Robert, take it away. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Judith. Um, and I think it's 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 uh, really um, nice that Catherine is supporting uh, the development of standards in 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 the e-mobility sector, because I think uh, I've I've been in uh, I think two forums where the the public oh, sorry the the companies was were kind of in in. Uh, suggesting that standards should come after the innovation. So I think I've had to always kind of convince them. And sometimes I've, I think uh, even there was a forum, I think yesterday or, or on Wednesday, where I, I ended up just listening to the comments and just ignoring and uh, hoping that we'll have another engagement where I'll educate uh, the public on the importance of standards to foster innovation. Anyway, so that was uh, just on that. But uh, in terms of um, immobility standards, um, in collaboration with uh, UNEP in 2018, we developed uh, 21 uh, Kenya national standards, which covered on uh, electric vehicles, uh, mopeds and motorcycles, as well as hybrid vehicles. Um, and in, that, in those series of standards, we were able to cover safety specifications, we were able to cover general specifications as well as testing uh, requirements. Um, uh, given that we had, uh, or right, right now we are having uh, new technologies coming up and we are having uh, different companies like OPBus doing retrofitting, I think uh, there's, there have been emerging, emerging gaps in terms of standardization, such as uh, developing a standard for retrofitting, um, I think we've we've also uh, we need also to develop standards for charging systems. We've not developed any any single standard on charging systems on battery swapping, and I think um, on um, on actually uh, engagement with the private sector. I got some sort of negative comment that we should wait till they are able to kind of land on their feet and uh, develop what they, 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 they need to do before we, we embark on uh, the development of standards. But uh, since uh, as a standardization guru, we know that standards uh, foster innovation. Uh, at the moment, we are currently in the, in the works of developing a technical committee on uh, electric mobility, which will uh, go straight on to, to develop uh, standards on charging infrastructure, because right now that is the biggest issue that we have in the country. I've seen so many companies um, starting to roll out and I've actually visited a few and we are, we are seeing kind of variations, it's, but, but in terms of charging infrastructure, it's, it's not that worrying but battery swapping for the two and three wheelers will be um, will be a challenge since uh, everyone in in the sector is doing their own thing so that is where we are at in terms of standards in kenya thank you thank you so much robert um steffi i can see there's a question on taxation would you like to take that question uh, i think we touched upon it a little bit um but i think there's a lot of effort by countries ongoing to reduce um, the import taxation for electric mobility. And I'm just wondering what the concrete plans uh, for Kenya are on that front, because that could really incentivize, incentivize a, a, a more rapid uptake. And I don't know if it's Robert or maybe Engineer Muchiri who want to maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, thank you, thank you for the question. In terms of um, incentives, the way uh, government incentives work is you build a group, uh, rally them around a, a particular issue, 
then present your issue, then uh, government listens to you, and then you begin to get some uh, incentives here and there. On electric mobility in particular, uh, since 2018, uh, 2018 and 2019, incentives uh, were provided. So some of the incentives were positive to the electric mobility and other incentives were indirect by sanctioning uh, petrol powered and diesel powered vehicles. So 2018, there was finance incentive. 2019, there was finance incentives. But I do wish to say that uh, electric mobility, it is not zero rated as such. So uh, the more we innovate, the more we adapt, and the more we embrace the, the technology, then we will have uh, the grounds to ask for even further incentives. A good example is the public charging infrastructure. We have not reached a stage where we can approach the county governments to 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 you know to to give licenses for free or no licenses or non requirement of a license for a public charging infrastructure for electric mobility because i don't think anybody has applied for it so as we move let us push both the national government and the county governments for incentives thank you Thank you, engineer. Um, and speaking of public charging infrastructure, Dennis, I know that there's a very interesting project that OPBUS is working on. Could you maybe tell us more on your challenges on this and what you're planning with public um, charging infrastructure? And of course, you can tie it in also to um, the comments by engineer Mushiri. Over to you, Dennis. Thank you very much, Judy, and I've listened uh, what engineer uh, Michael has talked about and also Catherine and uh, Robert. So my analogy would be if you have a house and you need to buy electronics, it is a must that you require for connection by Kenya Power so that you're able to run that uh, electric device. So what I'm trying to drive at is we first need to just to alleviate the chicken and egg problem, we first need to work on at least what we call charge baseline charging infrastructure. This is what will bring about, uh, bring confidence to potential buyers of e mobility products. So talking about charging infrastructure, I would, uh, because I've gone through uh, a couple of challenges, although we also have solutions to that which we might get to the respective organizations. One to Robert, I would say, uh, standardization of the ports. Yeah, we can say we'll use type two or CCS type two or CHAdeMO. Let's standardize that so that we do not create what we call uh, bad redundancy. Yeah, we should have good redundancy where we have uh, at any charging station go is a standard port. Uh, looking at uh, Catherine's docket now, Kenjan is a, in a very good position. You are leaders in uh, renewable energy within the region. It would be good to spearhead e-mobility uh, through you, especially, and it will be what you call double blessing that we are using green energy to spearhead green mobility. And um, like uh, Kenjan really to take it up and other organizations also in line with the claim reduction. So say, I haven't seen any government body per se coming out to buy a fleet of 100 uh, electric vehicle. That would be awesome. That would uh, spark, give us the spark to the growth of this sector because selling a new mobility device uh, and uh, government uses uh, double diesels, uh, definitely people will step back and wait. Then coming to engineer machinery, we, as we touched base, especially on the homologation processes, we had the challenge with conversion systems. 
So one, we do conversions both for electric motorbikes and also electric uh, buses and uh, land cruisers. So we have uh, had this change of particular issues with NTSA, but we can sit down and look at the framework to address this issue. So I would say that the ministry uh, can come up with a clean transport act just to cover the mobility sector, whether it's hybrids uh, or fully PEV and HCV, that's the hydrogen bit. And through this, I believe uh, immobility will start taking off. Yeah? And also we have people like GIZ. We are looking to funding opportunities so that we're able to increase uh, uptake of immobility. And we are in talks with a couple of financial institutions, especially when we are going to introduce the model two of a motorcycle so that we start deploying this as soon as possible. So basically coming back to our project, we are running charging stations and the electric bus pilot. We are locating two charging points in Pika and one in Nairobi, but we have started with one in Kiambu. Basically policy in terms of setting up charging infrastructure in the country is missing. The normal development control processes within county governments do not uh, have electric charging station as a, as a particular, yeah? because we have the EDAM systems that we have to apply through. So we've taken step by step, uh, uh, telling the county government, this is what e-mobility is all about, uh, looking at how to set up charging infrastructure, engaging KPLC on energy requirements, and they tell us we have to buy a transformer. A transformer is expensive. It, we can get that waiver. And I saw a notification that came to say, anybody who is a developer will have to buy his or her own uh, transformer. So I would like to encourage that immobility and the energy sector are very, very intertwined. And if we bring a thousand vehicles here, the grid will be affected. So Kenja and KPLC Ketrap will have to upgrade the grid as also Let me leave it at that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And over to Catherine. Catherine. Yes, I do have a follow-up comment for our valued participants. If you use a fast charger, it's going to cost you about one hour to charge. Eh? And I just want to use a case study of the Hyundai that were recently launched. It will cost you about an hour. And if you're going to use a slow charge, which you're going to install in your home, it will cost you about anything between seven hours and nine hours. So you can see the importance. If you do those calculations and you determine how long every car will be taking to charge for whatever they'll be using per day, you can see why the infrastructure charging facilities is an important discussion. And then regarding the energy, and Dennis has already spoken about it. If you look at the average uh, energy consumed in a household in, in Kenya right now is 200 kilowatt hours. If you have two cars, you might end up consuming another 100 per month. So your demand of energy is going to go up by 100 kilowatt hours, 50%. And so where is that power going to come from? So these are very, very important discussions. And of course, I already said earlier, you can power from the grid or you can power locally. And we are going to need incentives to help people who are going to develop charging infrastructure facilities in their homes as well, as the ones who are going to develop them in their facilities. I'm talking about hotels who decide to put up infrastructure, malls, and other such facilities, schools that put up for their feet. And of course, we also have to discuss, earlier on we did the needs assessment. It would be good to have a fleet retrofit training. Thank you so much, Judith. Thank you, Catherine. And um, Engineer Mushiri, C Catherine, we will be back to you on the energy questions, but just to get a round response from Engineer Mushiri and Robert as well to the issues that Dennis has raised and of course, Herman on the funding issue. So in that order, Engineer Mushiri, then Robert, then Herman. Uh, let me say that uh, uh, for Dennis, uh, the in, you know I, I I like his approach by the way 
that they are jumping every hurdle as they get to it. The county government, yes, the, all the county governments generally have, a, it's, it's an enterprise resource system, something similar to e-citizen when you're doing development control. So you make your application, you look for where electric mobility is, it is not there. So you have to sit down with them and now go manual because the digital system does not recognize you. It's a step-by-step -step process. And as we make a bigger group, as we make our case, as we lobby, as we converse, then we will have it inserted. But instead of even campaigning that it be inserted immediately, it's good to have a stakeholder uh, meeting for all those in the business of retrofits and uh, electric charging systems. So that when it is inserted in the system, it captures the needs for everybody. That is one. Two, in, uh, on the KPLC and energy and EPRA, Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority, I don't think there is an issue with the chargers that are available for, say, motorcycles, because they are using the normal socket electricity. But the minute you need electrical power than that uh, available from a socket in a domestic house, then you will need certain licenses to, 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 to redesign your electrical systems. So again, uh, some, you know, working probably with two cars, you may not need it, but some homes have more than two cars. Then more than two cars, you may need extra kilowatts. Hence, a change in the electrical supply system. That's again another... Uh, uh, issue we will need to deal with. On the, what uh, Robert mentioned about homologation, NTSA, for example, for you to get insurance of a retrofitted vehicle, you need the inspection certification by motor vehicle inspection unit. So motor vehicle inspection unit has to up their game, so to speak to recognize the electric retrofits so that they are able to give you the inspection sticker for insurance to provide you insurance. That's again a step uh, which uh, we are getting into slowly. Uh, again to Robert, I know there's this argument, what should come first? Should we provide the standard or should we allow and give space to free innovation? then bring in the standard later. And basically what we say is that so long as uh, what should come first, the only standard that should come first is safety on matters of safety. That whatever we are producing, whatever we are designing, whatever we are rolling out, safety, the standard has to come earlier. But whether it is this length, this width, this high, allow the market, Allow, you know, Kenyans, we are very good tech innovators and uh, let's give them space to innovate. Then we will come and do standards. Then even the government will also come and do regulation, but give them space. Uh, having said that, um, there was a, what, uh, I forget her name, the lady, Stephanie, what she, no, and the other gentleman, affordability. Affordability is very key. You remember the presentation that was done about the cost of buses in Costa Rica, Puerto Rico, China, and all. Affordability is very key. So even as we publicize electric mobility, we must make the technology affordable, particularly the total cost of ownership. Then a border border person who is a commercial person uh, will have the incentive to adapt it. But at the moment, we, we need to be a little bit more transparent uh, in terms of uh, how much does it cost. Share out that information and, uh, uh, you know, Kenyans are business people. And if it is uh, business-wise attractive, uh, they will roll into it. In terms of uh, electric buses, let me also say, yes, we do have a matter. They have a program 
and uh, it is also not lost that uh, NYS could come in later. It is also not lost that Kenya Railways has bought a few buses. They are not electric. Kenya Railways and NYS are not electric. They are all diesel, but they could be a platform for adoption of uh, electric buses going forward. Having said that, thank you, Judith. Thank you, Robert. Over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Judith. Um, I think you'll, you, you'll uh, have to repeat the, the first uh, issue that you wanted me to, dis to talk about. I think it was something about taxation, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Um, I think that has been explained well by Engineer Michael, uh, seeing as uh, we don't come in in the financial perspective. Rather, I think the only angle where we come in financially in terms of the cost of uh, vehicles is in the pre-verification of conformity, which happens once the unit is being um, uh, exported from the country of manufacture. So I think that is the only cost where we, we come in. And I think uh, what engineer Michael explained about taxation, that we'll have to leave it to the ministry. I wouldn't want to overstep and, and, and explain something that <laughs> uh, it is well in their mandate. Anyway, uh, maybe a comment that I think I, I can make, and I think Judith, you would have given me a, a, a session to do a presentation on standardization uh, to kick start the, the, the thought process on uh, immobility. So basically, um, one thing I'd like to note is that uh, standardization or standards in this, uh, uh, in this field or any other field are not to hinder innovation. Uh, what I mean is basically standards are usually bare minimums. It's just the, um, the least, uh, in terms of uh, specifications, it's usually the, the least acceptable limit. So um, in terms of innovation, and we are assuming that in this case, we are uh, the innovators or the companies which are in this sector are doing uh, over and above the bare minimum. So essentially it means that uh, the standards are below what they are trying to innovate or to invent. So that is what I meant by standards uh, uh, foster innovation. Uh, another point is that um, for the SMEs or for the manufacturers uh, who are entering into the market, um, standards uh, essentially help in reducing uh, redundancy. I think uh, this had been mentioned by Dennis and uh, it, it, it would be good once um, a new company is, is, is coming to set up shop in Kenya or any other country, that they have a standard to use so that they don't start reinventing the wheel. So that is what we are here to support, to support the, the new entrants in the market. I've, I've uh, talked to and engaged with, I think, two companies, uh, one uh, being a foreign company and another one, a local Kenyan startup on uh, electric two wheelers. Um, in which both of them are kind of redesigning their own batteries and doing their own um, whole concept on battery swapping. Um, it was very um, interesting and encouraging that we are having uh, uh, these innovations. But once we look, once you talk to them about the financial implication to the innovation, it's it, they are what they are really. Uh, uh, huge numbers in terms of uh, financial cost or the financial burden to the company. And I believe this is, this is money that could uh, be, um, the resources could be freed up to other um, innovative work in the company. Uh, things like battery technology, I think uh, right now at the moment we have a standard on uh, uh, batteries for electric vehicles, that is K. Uh, KS ISO 16898 or uh, 2012. So it's actually, it specifies the design system and uh, shapes and dimensions for secondary lithium ion batteries. Uh, so for the integration into the battery packs. So basically, instead of uh, reinventing the wheel, um, it is as easy as just purchasing the standard 
doing what is the bare minimum in that standard. And if you want to go over and above, um, you can use the resources that you've saved from not um, doing R&D into uh, improving the product or the battery or the battery swapping cabinet or the charger. So that is uh, what I meant by um, innovation, how standards uh, foster innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, wow, I mean, there's so much to say, but uh, we will first of all go to Herman and then circle back to Catherine and we see how much time we have to, if we don't, we're not able to tackle most of the questions, we can still take it up in another session. Um, so Herman, there was a question on funding from um, Dennis and also um, in after your presentation, there was an issue of, um, there is a requirement for most companies to have already uh, to already have proof of concept for them to access funding. So how can new companies be able to access funding? Herman, if you could uh, shed some light on this. Yeah, um, so I think what Dennis was referring to is um, our previous engagement, um, trying to mobilize resources uh, together. Not really a question to me about um, the funding issue. Um, because we were working together in an AMA proposal, um, looking at um, getting um, financial resources for that. I mean, overall as well, I just wanted to clarify that GIZ is really not a donor, um, primarily. We also um, work quite aggressively trying to re mobilize resources. I mean, our main um, um, funder, if I can use that word of donor, is, is the German government. So we have internal mechanisms to raise resources, but we also open to offer advisory to um, companies who work together, um, you know, through um, cooperation to uh, mobilize resources. But I wanted to sort of diverse, Judith, if you can allow me, to a few issues. I really um, liked um, what Dennis brought up. Um, I think it's quite critical and always interesting to listen to the industry and uh, all these issues that come up also inform um, part of the work we did as we do as GIZ in terms of our engagement with um, with engineer Mushiri. Um, I see Catherine also here. Um, we work quite closely with um, from GIZ side with um, Kenjan. So I would I would also like to point out since we have this prominent decision makers that the industry is at the moment quite well organized, I would say. The immobility e um, space is, from the industry side, it's very well organized um, in terms of exchange of communication insights and that sort of thing. So it's always very easy to identify um, where there are pain points that need to be addressed. Um, my main issue, I would say, is um, I think we need to kick off the process of setting the regulatory environment um, straight as soon as possible. Um, we are really delaying, I don't know, waiting for <laughs> what exactly, but I think the regulatory environment is, is a really um, um, an, an urgent space that needs to be addressed. Um, what um, Dennis also pointed out, something like a clean um, um, transport act, I think it's a really you know, great idea. But I know Engineer Mushiri might highlight this, that the Ministry of Transport is looking at the moment into a transport and electric mobility policy. So this will fundamentally provide the overall framework and guidance on how the industry also developed. There was a question from um, Emily in the chat about um, what targets we have moving forward or what we've set um, with regards to electric mobility, um, you know, targets, initiative, and what we need to, to work towards. I think at the moment, the only target that has been set is in the clean energy, energy efficiency strategy, and looking at a 5% import in 2025, um, which is, you know, not very ambitious from my point of view. And considering all the work that is being done at the moment, we need to set a little bit more um, ambitious um, targets, also to send the correct political signals that we are working towards something very, um, you know, uh, uh, practical. Also, um, with regards to, as I mentioned, my presentation, my main point was we set the, the, the regulatory environment side well, we send the correct political signals, and we're also able to, um, you know, use this as a basis for resource mobilization overall, but primarily from the climate finance side where I, my experience is. So making sure we have the clear targets as far as mobility is concerned, making them as practically ambitious as possible, and then you can use this as basis um, for raising resources. I know the, count, the Nairobi County, um, I think NMS is leading a process of developing regulations. So this is something I, I guess um, Dennis and team, you know, the private sector players in the room can also really try as much as possible to be involved and inform how this works out. But as GIZ, um, as I said, um, we're really open to discuss primarily um, also with the 
private sector players and, and see how to support um, or inform our engagement with, with GOK around policy and, and these sort of issues. So I see time is really running out, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, um, Judith, for this really wonderful session. Thank you. Thanks, Norman. And Catherine, um, over to you, circling back to you. Catherine, do we have the energy? Do we have the infrastructure? And where are we moving, especially now, considering how immobility is fast moving in the country? You've spoken about increase in um, energy demand with the uptake of immobility. So where are we at? What's the current state? And where are we going in terms of energy production and the infrastructure? Thank you, Judy. Um... First of all, there's the Energy Act, and there are all the changes that are going to happen there in the new opportunities. You heard Dennis earlier talking about getting your own transformer. I think he means if you're going to get your own captive energy, which we are going to see happening more. I think some of us have already seen, for example, large companies such as East African breweries advertising. KTDA has been at it for years. So yes, there are plants at Kenjen. We are rolling out more and more geothermal energy. We are continuing to prospect for geothermal. And so we need to be, I think it's, it's, it's comfortable to say that we are going to grow the energy, either through companies such as Kenjen or individuals who are developing captive energy because of the provisions that the Energy Act is now giving. So we are going to have enough energy. In, in terms of infrastructure, um, one thing I see is how to, uh, we are concerned about least cost because the potential to continue um, charging the vehicles from the grid may not be uh, always your, your best option. We are looking at people who are going to create their own active power and charge their vehicles. That is going to be the big difference. But unlike the first where most of the power has been sourced from the grid in the future, some people are actually going to design their own captive power to charge their feet. And for that, we have to think about the demand at night because for those who are going for solar options, there is going to be no solar at night. And therefore the issue of battery energy storage system or any other storage system might kick in. And that is where the, the discussion is going to go. But in terms of the amount of power, uh, I can assure you that I was going to refer to the, the telecom sector. Remember when the telecom sector was opened up and Kenyans just adopted mobile phones overnight, I, that's what I anticipate will happen with mobility, whether it's the uh, personal use or public use. And therefore we are going to have to ramp up quickly, but I think the country is ready for that ramp up. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you to all our panelists and speakers. Very interesting discussions, very interesting inputs. And I think this calls for another session actually, because there's so much that we still need to discuss. Um, and of course, um, our colleague Martin Eshiwani was not able to be here, but he will be with us in the next session. So I hope our speakers are, um, are available for another session, which we might organize possibly next year. And we will be in touch to see what other discussions we can have together. Very quickly, in the interest of time, I will hand over to Stephanie who will do closing remarks for us. And also just to remind all our participants, the recording of this session and the presentations will be made available on our website. And there are other resources as well on our website from the previous trainings. Thank you very much, colleagues. Steffi, over to you. Thanks, Judith. And thanks also from our side to all the speakers and the audience. I think it was a very fruitful discussion. I am picking on the last sentence of Catherine. She was saying the country is ready for the ramp up. Um, I, I did feel uh, the same being part and participating in this discussion. I think what became very obvious is that a lot of different layers are needed for successful electric mobility implementation, but we did speak to those different actors and uh, the actors seem to be on board to push for the right policies, for the right regulatory frameworks, for the right standards, for the right um, um, uh, vehicles, uh, the, the right pilot project. So it's it's great to see that uh, Kenya is moving towards uh, towards a transition uh, to immobility, and we remain uh, there to support from the Solutions Plus project. Um, please stay tuned also for upcoming training opportunities, and we look forward to collaborate with all of you going forward. Thank you so much.